Welcome to the Underhood Service Podcast. This episode is presented by Mala, manufacturers of engine components, filters, and peripherals. Visit mala-aftermarket.com to learn more. And now, here's your host, Andrew Markell. Welcome to the third installment of the Underhood Service Podcast. Today, we're talking with Tom Walsh from Mala, who is the product coordinator for filtration and thermal management. And we're talking oil filters today. Welcome, Tom. Thanks for having me. I look forward to discussing filters. So what should a technician be looking at when they pull off an old filter? Well, I think they should look, of course, for the obvious things. The gasket, did it remain stuck on the, on the engine? Is there any debris? Just dump the filter out. What's it feel like? What's it look like? Um, are the sides sucked in? You know, how's the canister look? W- with a spin-on type, there's not much you can do but look at it. But I think from a technician's point of view, if, if you're worried about something, they're not that difficult to cut open if you have a die grinder. There's specialty tools to cut them open, which aren't that expensive. But, but really, if you don't have one, just cut a die grinder around the top, take it out and look at it and inspect the media. And that's going to tell you a lot about what's going on. And then once, once it's open, you can look for particles. If you're worried and you see some metal chunks, take a magnet. Steel's going to stick to a magnet. So steel comes off. Aluminum isn't. So steel, you're probably going to, depending on the sides of the pieces, you're going to be a little more worried about steel than aluminum, especially depending on if the engine's way past break-in period. If, if you have some chunks of steel, that's a pretty serious issue. Um, so that, I think that's a good thing to look at, but, but really just the obvious for the average oil change, just to make sure you're not going to double gasket something and to make sure the filter just comes off and looks how it should. Is it, is it overly heavy? If it's heavy, it's, maybe it's got a lot of sludge in it. Why? Did someone wait too long between oil changes or there's something else going on? Should they be looking when they open it up at the uh, drain back valve and the uh, bypass valve? Yeah, that's a good thing to look at. Um, a lot of filters you're not going to see if that's activated by just taking it off. But the best thing is to look at the media. If, if the filter media is clogged, then the bypass valve is probably activated. Um, and then the drain back, yeah, was it working? Did it fail? You can, you can tell. If, is, it, is it saturated in oil from, from the opposite side? And that's going to tell you if it's, you know, was oil draining back when it shouldn't have been. So the next question, what's the relationship between filter efficiency and capacity? So just a simple answer is efficiency is basically the size of the particles being filtered. That's generally measured in microns or thousands of an inch or whatever. Um, so a good filter, you want it filtering everything down to like 20 to 30 microns in size. Um, capacity is the amount of debris that a filter can hold. Um, you'll see it measured in grams. Such and such filter can hold 13 grams of debris. So the relationship is the best you want is high efficiency, high capacity. Of course, there's always that, you know, well, you filter the small particles first and then what happens? What's the relationship with that? My recommendation is to just get one that's high in efficiency, high in capacity, and then you don't have to worry about too much else. So that kind of brings up the next point about is there such thing as an extended interval oil filter? I I would say yes and no. I say yes because I consider a premium oil filter something that is an extended mileage oil filter if it's premium. But but basically, if you're running synthetic oil, then that's something you should always be using is an extended mileage oil filter or a premium oil filter. That's a mistake you see often. I put synthetic oil in 10,000 mile oil, 7,500 mile oil, but I ran the regular filter. Well, that's that's not going to work because that filters for three to 5,000 miles. And go really by what your OE ratings are. They do that for a reason. A lot of engineering goes into that. The OE is running synthetic, and then it probably came with an OE quality synthetic filter. And look for a manufacturer in the aftermarket who's making a reputable filter like that. Um, Basically, it would be a premium filter. Some call it high mileage. Others just market it as we market a premium filter. Um, So that's why it's kind of a yes and no. If someone's marketing an extended life filter, then what's the regular filter? How, how's that one working and what, what's that one doing and, and what's the difference? So I think you're better off with just a better filter all the time. It's a cheap part. It's not that much to get the better one. And what it does and the safety it provides for your engine is, is going to pay dividends down the line for using a premium filter. So. This was a question that we had recently for one of our videos and everything else and sort of a debate we had around the office what is the best place to find the instructions for installing a filter? Is it the box? Is it the side of the can? Is it all data? So if, if you're a technician, I would say all data or whatever software you're using, for sure. Um, 
for DIY, I would go to the internet. I mean, everyone's got mass amounts of information at their fingertips with their smartphone. I just haven't seen enough different filter boxes and filter cans to know what to trust. I mean, they basically have the, you know, lube the gasket, install to a certain tightness or three quarters past tight with your hand. But uh, just to be safe, there's so much more variety of vehicles and engines and oils and oil filters. Hop online or if you're a tech, hop on all data or whatever software you're using and just double check. And for me, that I think that's the best way to go about it. So getting more into the cartridge oil filter, what are some of the most common errors that you see a technician doing when performing a cartridge oil filter? Let's see, they're on like a large diesel truck or even some of the, uh, the vehicles nowadays. Um, pulling the drain plug before removing the cartridge filter, especially the top mounted ones. At the very least, loosen that, loosen the, the, the filter cap, but or just pull that filter out because of the way the anti-drain back works, there's, there's, there's oil stuck up there and you want to release that pressure because that's going to be some of the dirtiest oil trapped in there and you want that to get drained out. So let that drain down, then pull your drain plug. Um, another one is, of course, changing the O-rings. There's always the O-rings on the cap and it's funny, I, I, a lot of techs don't change it, but we all know how important it is on a spin-on type to lube that gasket and make sure it's ready to go. It might look fine now, but what is it going to do next time, especially if you're at 5,000 to 10,000 mile intervals? So pull that O-ring, apply some oil to it, to the new one, put it on, and, and that's a good way. And another thing is with cartridge filters, you're never going to have a better opportunity to inspect a filter than with a cartridge. You don't have to cut it open. There it is. Look at it. Inspect it. What kind of debris is in there, if any? So you're not doing an oil change on a car that has chunks of chunks of debris, chunks of steel in it that you're going to start up and a thousand miles down the road, the customer is going to have an engine failure where you could tell them right now, find a problem, diagnose it and, you know, prevent a problem. So what procedures should a technician be following when they're doing an oil change on a vehicle with a top mounted cartridge oil filter? Well, they should definitely be removing the filter first and letting that drain down into the engine before removing the drain plug. Because of course uh, there can be oil left over in that in the filter housing, and then you're going to add your your required five, six, seven quarts, and now you might be a half quart, a quarter quart too full, especially for your larger filters, probably in your big trucks, especially your diesel trucks, um, and then even in your smaller vehicles, tolerances on today's engines are so much higher that you need to be right at that 4.7 quarts or whatever it may be. You don't want to be over or below at, at all. So for an oil filter, what's the most stressful time for it? Is it during startup or high RPM operation when the oil pressure might be higher at 67 PSI? In my opinion, it's it's cold starts. And the difference between a cold start and a high RPM is the temperature of the oil. On a cold start, you're going to have cold oil. Uh, the viscosity is going to be it's going to be more like like honey rather than than water, for, for example. So that's going to create high pressure through the passages, and that's when filter manufacturers worry the most about that burst pressure rating. That's that's when that, that filter can burst. Um, luckily today, most filters are manufactured. That, that should never become an issue. Cold start or high RPMs, if your filter bursts, you got some major issue somewhere else. But cold start is definitely going to be harder on an oil filter. Kind of curious, the main area that's going to burst on a filter, it's not going to be the can or the seam. Is it going to be the, the seal itself? The seal itself is where you'd probably first start to see oil kind of, the, the, the seal would fail. But I think even before a seal would fail, you'll see um, it wouldn't burst, but, but for a canister type, that can is going gonna, is gonna to expand. You're going to see it kind of blow up a little bit, almost like you're shooting air into it. And then the seal is going to fail. And if it actually ruptures, yeah, you've got major problems. Yeah, your oil filter is the least of your problems in that case. So. Well, thank you, Tom. That's great information on oil filters. I think, you know, you don't realize how complex they are until you really start looking at them. Well, that concludes our third podcast on oil filters. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for having me. And thanks, audience, for being there for us and downloading this podcast. And thank you, Framala, for sponsoring it, too. Thank you for listening. 